Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know that the session after lunch is always the one most challenging, but I can promise you that this one will be quite energetic because at the end of the day, it touches upon the very essence of the three preceding topics, namely NATO and Russia. The relationship between NATO and Russia clearly is at the very core of the Riga Security Forum. And you could argue of all security issues these days in the 21st century. That is why, that is why now there's no longer any tiptoeing around. We are going to ask straight and forward from by our uh, wonderful speakers. And this is going to be the Slido question going in. Namely, if you look at the conflicts and tensions between Russia and NATO today, who, in your opinion, is primarily responsible for the current complicated relationship between NATO and Russia? That is in exactly the very essence of our next session. Of course, we know the world is not black and white, and we will hear more about the shades of gray, if you will, in, in just a moment. But at the end of the day, this is the question we're asking. Who is primarily responsible for the current strained relationship between Russia and NATO? Who's at fault? Now, 15 people so far have only voted. I think we can do better. Get out. We were up to 50, 60 in previous debates. So get out your cell phone, even though I know it's after lunch and the digesting process is still in place. But do get it out. And we have two gentlemen arguing on behalf of the Russian motion, on behalf of the Russian position, saying at the end of the day, NATO is primarily at fault. NATO is primarily to be blamed for the strained relationships. And we have two gentlemen who will argue against and say, no, not so fast. Russia indeed here is a driving factor for the strained relationship. Now, if I'm looking at the poll, and I see already some have their work cut out for themselves. <laughs> the verdict is quite clear, at least in the beginning. We will do the very same question. We will do the very same Slido after the session will end to see if any minds, any attitudes were changed throughout the course of this debate, ladies and gentlemen. And to kick off, to kick off this debate with a three to four minute statement, as to why NATO is to be blamed, that NATO is primarily responsible for strained relations. It's my pleasure now to yield the floor to a leading researcher of the Euro-Atlantic Security Center at the MGMO Institute for International Studies, MGIMO. Wonderful to have him here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sergei Markedonov. Thank you. Thank you for the floor. I see uh, rather challengeable results to discuss. Uh, prior this minute, uh, we uh, discussed Russia with no engagement of Russian representatives. Now, of course, I'm not representing the official position. I'm an expert and uh, leading researcher and GMO. But nevertheless, uh, we should a uh, little bit, uh, how to say, uh, to make to the more balanced approach uh, to here. Some thesis, because of uh, lack of uh, my time. First thesis. We uh, started uh, discussing uh, NATO-Russia relations like something appeared in 2014. It's not quite true. The first crisis in NATO-Russia relations took place in 1998. And due to Russia's initiative that time, a uh, founding act between NATO and Russia was suspended. Second point, NATO-Russia tensions is not about one personality, pleasant or unpleasant. It depends on the angle of your observation. It's not accident whim of Mr. Putin, of course. If we can imagine tomorrow Mr. Putin will fly to the moon, situation not change immediately because uh, the uh, crisis and tensions between Russia and NATO have systemic nature. It's not about one, two personalities. We are heard uh, from uh, all distinguished, distinguished participants here about fears of NATO, about Russia, or scares or phobias and so on. Now it's time to address to Russia's fears and scares about NATO. 
First point, uh, results of Cold War, because there were not formal agreement on the Cold War in different narratives of interpretation. Russia didn't consider and is not considering itself like a country defeated. Uh, and this is why it helped us to explain uh, many things. Uh, second point, Russia is dissatisfied their transformation of European security to a completely Euro-Atlantic one with US dominance in Europe. The first statement on this topic uh, appeared in uh, Budapest uh, OSCE summit in December 1994 when first president of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, said about cold peace replacing cold war and uh, the next point is dissatisfaction with indivisibility of uh, security. Because now European security change, uh, uh, become uh, something uh, Euro-Atlantic with uh, no serious taking into the account Russian position. Of course, Russia is not so naive to say that NATO position should be abandoned and Russia would dictate. But uh, Russia is interested to have decision-making process where Russian voice is serious, not declarative like uh, NATO-Russia uh, Council, uh, of course. Uh, one more point uh, about post-Soviet space. It's a sphere of my particular interest. Of course, Russia is not so interested to see uh, instrumentalization of tensions around post-Soviet space with engagement of NATO because of particular interest of Russia. Those particular interests are not explained through the desire of Russia to restore USSR or Russian empire. A lot of economic interest. Russian foreign policy has been shaped due to uh, two basic uh, processes, two collapses. Collapse of the USSR and search of post-Soviet Russian identity and collapse of yalta Potsdam system. It's very interesting because now we see a paradox. People in the West appeal to Helsinki not uh, considering changes in Europe prior to 2014. I am not sure that Slovakia or Slovenia or Georgia signed Helsinki Final Act, by the way. What's about GDR, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, USSR, and so on and so on. But at the same time, European politicians don't like Yalta and Potsdam. Established conditions for the uh, Helsinki Final Act and uh, European security architecture, and so on. And one more point, last not the least. Uh, uh, usually when we uh, argue with a European and American colleague, our counterparts appeal to uh, Paris Charter of November 1990. It's one of my beloved exercises with a student. I ask them how many times NATO was mentioned in this document. And they try to offer their ideas two times, four times, nothing. Because Paris Charter offered Europe with no military blocks. Not Europe with iron curtains. But we see dominance, clear dominance of NATO with ignorance of many Russian interests. Mm -hmm. And a lot of points for uh, further discussion. Thank right. you so much. Thank you so much, Sergey. Please give him a hand. Uh, <laughs> indeed, thanks for kicking it off. And no worries, we will do four more rounds, actually, with your inclusion, with your participation. But for now, I think you made it quite clear, appealing for an understanding of Russia's position, saying the relationship, Russia as a country and the relationship between Russia and NATO is bigger and stronger and, and certainly more relevant than just one person to be defined through one person, ladies and gentlemen. Now to argue against this particular point of view, it's my great pleasure to yield the floor to the associate fellow for the, in the Russia Eurasia program at uh, Chatham House. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for James Scher. I must do the worst thing possible and antagonize the moderator. I am, I am a senior fellow of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at um, ICDS. In you Tommy. don't antagonize me one bit. It's quite um, pleasing to hear. And, and, um, I'm always charmed when a moderator says over lunch, speak for four minutes, and then at the beginning of the session, speaks for, speak for three to four minutes. Uh, but um, I, it's a rare privilege to agree so much with what an antagonist like Sergei has to say. Uh, the question, this question, who is to blame? It's an inescapable question, but it trivializes the problem. The issue is, why have these tensions arisen 
and why do they matter? Russia and the West today inhabit two different cognitive and normative worlds. That means different strategic cultures, different value systems, um, and uh, of course, uh, different, norm different models of governance, uh, and of course, different aspirations, and that means today that we have very different, and in many ways, deeply opposed interests. Putin's contribution has been to rehabilitate many of the principal orthodoxies that made Russia, Russia, well before the Soviet period, from the time of Nikolai I, in some respects from the time of Catherine the Great, and even before that. And in essence, that means that today, what we see in Russia is a degree of, of integration in the perspectives of the state leadership, the defense and security establishments, um, beyond anything we witnessed uh, in, the, in the 90s and 80s, which were periods of tension. It means also the rehabilitation of very stark, traditional, very Russian views of geopolitics, which are about occupying and dominating space, irrespective of the views of people who live there. The grammar and syntax of Russian strategic thinking is about space, defense perimeters, which are almost always on the external borders of other people's countries, buffer zones, spheres of influence, all of this is now reiterated and modernized. And finally, the rehabilitation of a very old belief that Russian civilization extends beyond the boundaries of the Russian state and confers upon Russia uh, special prerogatives in other states on which Russians, Russian speakers, and people historically influenced by Russia reside. The issue is not whether these views are sincere, they are. The issue is not whether they are coherent and logical, they are. The major implication is what are the implications of all of this for other people? If I may, my penultimate uh, point. Yes. It also greatly trivializes the issue to reduce it to the question of NATO enlargement. NATO was, I personally was, a late and reluctant convert to enlargement. Enlargement became NATO policy when the demands of others who wished to join NATO became impossible to resist. When the Poles, the Czechs, the Estonians finally got us to understand what would happen in these countries if that door were closed. The second reason this is trivializing the problem, in fact, it's a red herring, is that when Viktor Yanukovych became president of Ukraine, he took the issue of NATO enlargement off the table. Ukraine became officially a non-bloc state. All of the structures in the Ukrainian state dealing with NATO integration were summarily liquidated, very brutally liquidated. Um, and he assumed then, now the pressure will be off and now I will be free to move closer to the EU. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, the pressure increased. And when he objected, Dmitry Medvedev, who was president at the time, said, it is only the, uh, it is only the beginning. In conclusion. Short one. Yes. <laughs> two axioms will conclude this. Um, Sergei Narishkin, now the director of Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, then the chairman of the State Duma, said the West in 2014, either the West relearns the lessons of Yalta or it risks war. And the final one, relevant to a Latvian audience, is what was said in my hearing by a very senior Russian foreign policy uh, official, uh, the Baltic states need to consider the events in Ukraine and draw their own conclusions. Um, so right. the question, in the end, I leave you with a question. What are the implications for others? 
if we are prepared to discuss security on the Russia's basis, on the basis of its premises, can Europe live with that and accept it? Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. I think we're off to a very energetic start with both Sergei and uh, James making very strong arguments uh, from their point of view, putting a bit of a historic perspective here also, James. Uh, thank you so much. Now, back to back, we have two more speakers to conclude the very first round. Next up, he's a researcher at the Baltic Defense College arguing why Russia is not to be blamed for the current strained relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, welcome Vilyar Vebel. So when I first was invited here, I was to be a devil's advocate, not a devil itself. A devil in Estonian language is called Kurat. And it's not a Russian word. It's, a, it's not a Russian word because the Russia has not been the most long-term occupant of Baltic states. It's a German word. It's a German priest, which symbolizes the all evil for the Estonian people. We have no, almost no Russian words for evil things. So that is, I think, the historical starting point of our thinking who are occupying us during the last 1,000 years in the longest term. So we have been independent 50 years, and everybody has contributed, starting from Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Poland, and also mm -hmm. Russia. So the study is the tensions in the region, the tensions might not come from Russia, the tensions might be that we are in certain geographical location, there is a strategic competition. Now to the topic, after 15 years of happiness in NATO, do you feel more secure? Do you feel that uh, Russia feels more comfortable, more trading with us? Do you feel that they understand us? Do you feel that what, if you say them that they have to be following European normative power and they have to be deterred first, do they understand? Do you really believe that Sergei or somebody in Russia does understand the logic why they should be first feeling lower than you because you put your normative power to those who you want to change? And you do that because they have to obey to your rules. I haven't heard from West not a single time that let's agree on some common rules. If you look at the normative power, all the rules come from West and go to Russian side. So this can be understandable for Western brains that you obey and you are deterred and you obey. But I don't think the alpha male brains of Ilya Muromets or Vladimir Putin really follow that logic. But it doesn't disturb us. We still say, let's put more pressure, maybe the chakras will open in his head. But if you look again at the history, Russia has always committed to, to fight political and cultural occupation from West, not the economic occupation from East. All the Russian heroes, they went against the Germans. They went against the Polish, while the uh, Mongolians or the others were easily let in from the east. And the same happens today again. There is more motivation to fight NATO and West than there is motivation to fight China and East. And the question, uh, how should Russia react? So basically we pressurize them, they feel it's like aggressiveness from others, our side. So you don't become a national hero in Russia when you are the third. You become a national hero <laughs> when you are punching above your weight, you're really going to the last blood drop, so you start to escalate. So we get more tensed again because we think they are the aggressive ones, we escalate a bit more. Then they escalate a bit even more. What happens then? There are two scenarios. We accidentally go to conflict, or Russia runs out of money and repeats what happened in the end of Soviet Union, anarchy. And the question is, which one do you want? Do you want really them to go to bankruptcy? or you want them to go to anarchy, or you want to have a Marshall Plan for Russia. So the final comment is, if you're not planning to do something really decisive, what we did in Libya and Iraq, really bringing the democracy and welfare to those nations, uh, then I think to convince Russians, we need a first a positive proposal for them. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Bill Yar. <laughs> Let me do that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, uh, Sergei, uh, James, and Villiers. And last but certainly uh, not least uh, is, I'm very much looking forward, he's a senior associate at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Wolfgang Richter. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Asli. I would agree with James that we should not trivialize, uh, trivialize the question here. Who is to blame? That is your task as a moderator. My answer would be a little bit more sophisticated and would uh, certainly feed in some shades of gray. Um, after the end of the Cold War in 1989-1990, the prospects for future pan-European security cooperation looked quite bright. The key words are the unification of Germany, which was associated with the promise to keep strategic restraint and uh, not to station foreign forces in East Germany after the withdrawal of Soviet forces. The Charter of Paris, which marked the turn towards security cooperation and political reform. And it was agreed by all, not just by the West. Strategic restraint was fortified further by the complete fulfillment of arms control reduction liabilities and the withdrawal of Russian forces from Central Europe and from the Baltic States. We cooperated in the United Nations and in the Dayton Contact Group, just to name a few. All OSCE participating states committed to create a common security area without dividing lines and geopolitical zero-sum games. That are key still stays alive today, although it's not implemented. When disputes arose over NATO's first enlargement to include Central European states, and over the war in Kosovo, a new compromise was found. It was built around the adaptation agreement to the CFE Treaty and the European Security Charter of the OSCE and the NATO-Russia Founding Act. So pan-European cooperation was possible, worked well, I would say, during 15 years. Um, and that shows that there is another historical example. The question is, is it possible to think in future of that kind of scenario? For the moment, it seems, of course, very bleak. So, a few years later, sharp controversies arose again over the US withdrawal from the ABM Treaty in 2002, the following buildup of missile defense in Europe, the war in Iraq, uh, the stationing of forces in Romania and Bulgaria, NATO's refusal to ratify the CFE Adaptation Agreement, and Russia's suspension of the CFE Treaty. With the recognition of the independence of Kosovo and NATO's decision in April 2008 to offer Ukraine and Georgia future accession to the alliance, mutual relations soured and distrust reached its first nadir with the, with the August war in Georgia in 2008. So who is to blame for that development? It is no clear-cut answer on that. I think the, the, the picture is uh, mixed. After a short recovery under the Obama administration, however, mutual trust collapsed completely when Moscow decided, I will come to the end on that because here is the answer more clear, completely uh, collapsed when Moscow reacted on the Maidan revolution in Kiev by intervening in Ukraine and uh, annexing Crimea in violation of international law. So obviously Moscow saw a need to, uh, uh, a strategic need to secure its fleet bases, but it justified that action by uh, uh, the reference to the need to protect countrymen in the near abroad. So it was no wonder that uh, fears were caused, particularly in countries that have large Russian-speaking minorities, and Russia and, and NATO reacted on these worries by the well-known uh, reassurance, political and military reassurances. Mm -hmm. But prudently, and that we have to add here, it stayed within the limits of the NATO-Russia founding act and kept restraint as to the permanent stationing of additional substantial combat forces. So that left something of the earlier key on which one could uh, build in future. And I should add finally that since then, any military build up, even minor build up, and movements, in particular large scale and snap exercises in the region, cause suspicion and lead to further tension. So the rules based order is challenged here. I'm not saying that Moscow is the only quarter to challenge rule, the rules based international order, but this challenge 
concerns the European mm. security. And here we have to do something more interesting. It will be hopefully your second question. Where do we get out from this? How do we get out from that uh, situation and what would we propose for the future? Thank you so much. Thank you so much to uh, Wolfgang Richter. <laughs> and indeed, the final round, the final round uh, which we will come to uh, will address exactly the question that you have posed, namely how to get out of this quadrangle. But for the second round, and for that we will remain seated, I will give each of you two, three minutes max to respond to what you just heard. So, uh, Sergey, you can respond here to what uh, Wolfgang and James have said. Why, why are they wrong? Why are they wrong? <laughs> a lot of points, by the way. Yeah. First point uh, concerns values. Values didn't uh, become obstacles for integration to NATO, Turkey, Greece, Portugal, under Salazar. This is why it's not crucial. If it's interesting, United States or democratic countries can cooperate with Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and some other democratic countries. No problem. This is why this argument is not so right, completely at least. Uh, second point concerns the factor of support of ethnic Russians abroad. I suppose it's uh, seriously overrated after Crimea. Russia is engaged in uh, many uh, processes in, of conflict resolution, but let's see. In Abkhazia, Russians composed 13%. In Nagorno-Karabakh, about 1%. In South Ossetia, two or a little, little bit uh, uh, about it. Uh, Transnistria, uh, 25%. But uh, nevertheless, Russia is interested because the problem of the USSR collapse is not seriously studied. It was well perceived in the West like something inevitable and wishful. But sometimes, in many aspects, it was a serious split. It was a problem of identity. My uh, honorable colleague said about problem of Crimea and annexation and so on. It's one part of the uh, coin, one side of the coin. The other side, mm -hmm. let's see. Uh, on Crimea, 12, uh, 19,000 uh, Ukrainian troops were deployed, but 12,000 of them changed their loyalty to Russia, mm -hmm. including commander-in-chief of Ukrainian Navy. A lot of people having Ukrainian passport preferred Russia. Is it interesting to analyze? Of course, yes. Because the problem of searching of identity is also very important. Mm. It's impossible to restrict our analysis only by legal formalities. This is why it's necessary to enlarge our analysis. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Sergey. James, uh, what aspects about uh, the uh, initial statements by Sergey and Villiar would you like to respond to? Right. Um, the main one is that in Sergei's initial statement, uh, he referred at least once to Yalta and Potsdam as being the foundations of European security. And that is key to the point that I am making. This is a fundamental difference between the way Russia today understands European security and the way we do. I am sure Sergei knows as much as I do that the founding uh, conference and document of the OSCE extended the OSCE, the Helsinki principles, to all the newly independent states. That when Russia signed the NATO Russia Founding Act, Russia signed this act, it not only referred to um, the um, uh, un inalienable principles of sovereignty and independence, but also the rights of states to choose their own partners, uh, their own security partners, and make and, and their own direction. May I just pick up uh, two points to make very Quickly, briefly? Please. The first is that obviously you cannot just extract values from all the other issues that I hope I fairly touched upon. Uh, strategic interests, strategic culture, um, and I am not saying that all of this the difference is simply about values, but let us remember historically that when Turkey was brought into NATO, Turkey was brought into NATO at a time when we all lived in dread from day to day that the Cold War could turn hot at any moment, and when Turkey's independence was being threatened. These were very different times from those we live in now. And finally, about Ukraine. There has never been a time in eastern Ukraine when uh, supporters of either a separate entity or of joining Russia exceeded, in any part of eastern Ukraine, 
That's a lot of people. That's a major security problem if things go wrong. I am not diminishing it or trivialising it, but let's keep it in perspective and let's also remember that Igor Girkin, uh, the first def uh, Moscow-appointed defence minister of the Donetsk People's Republic, said at the beginning, if it weren't for our GRU contingent, everything here would have fallen apart in a few days. And he went on to add, my greatest regret is, Nash narod nas. our people do not uh, support us. Mm. So this is a broader perspective, right. but it's certainly not a black and white issue. Thanks. Thank you, James. So I see uh, no persuasion on either side so far uh, that we can detect of uh, Villiar. You listen intently to what Wolfgang and James uh, had to say. Uh, here's your opportunity to respond to them. <coughs> yes, uh, it looks like uh, the sides are using the examples uh, which fit better for their argumentations, but the uh, question is that we are at the moment uh, debating the local regional security questions uh, which have the strategic importance. And, uh, and those two things uh, we mix as only we want. So uh, for us here in this hall, the regional security is important and we believe that it can be solved here. Uh, as it looks for me in, in Moscow, it looks like a strategic struggling, which is more important. And the places where it happens to be are just the locations where it has happened always. So this is the part of the imperial game which has always been there. And uh, if uh, it was like said that it's like we are not imperial and they are imperial, I'm not very sure uh, how many common values do we have with Donald Trump or how many Donald Trump has with Hillary Clinton at all or with Emmanuel <laughs> Macron. Are there any specific Western values represented, for example, by Donald, by Boris? Uh, so. Uh, are they less imperial? Are they less interested about controlling the other countries than Russia is? Or is Russia just mimicking them, uh, doing the same as they usually say? Uh, or it's the normal practice? So uh, in my opinion, uh, we just give this uh, taste, the spice, how we want to say, if it's small nations, then we say it's about independence, uh, having uh, our life as we want. But now coming to the Baltic example, our most Defense contribution, the biggest, is to be ready to receive NATO forces. It's not about us deciding what happens because we don't have single tank, single jet fighter, single ship. It's, it's not, the decision is not ours. We are not the regional security providers. We can just invite the Germans, the British, the Americans, or the Russians and pay for them. And this is how it looks to Moscow. As long as you don't act as an independent nation, you act as a playground. So you tease the Russians to play because as you don't have anything except the Americans who are next to the St. Petersburg backyard. Thank you. Thank you, Villiar. Uh, frank words here on the stage, but that's exactly what we want. We want the bluntness in order to highlight the various differences. And to conclude the second round is, of course, Wolfgang again. Wolfgang, you're up uh, next. You listen to Villiar. You listen to Sergei. What would you like to tell them? Let me take on one, um, one statement of Vilga that there are no common rules agreed, but they are basically Western rules. I would strongly reject that idea. The Charter of Paris was agreed by all states that were at the time member states of the CECE, and shortly afterwards, after the breakdown of the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, all the uh, follow up, I mean the, the post Soviet states, the CIS states, uh, joined the OSCE and uh, they all adhered, agreed, at least adherence one can debate, but or they all agreed on these principles. These principles were never put into question in the OSCE, even not today, after 30 years. So this notion I have really to, to reject. On the other hand, when it comes to values, I agree on the importance of values as well, but we are talking here about uh, security interests, basically, and I would be moderate as a Western, as part of the West and say, we have to struggle with values in our own camp. I don't like the word camp, but it is the case. We have to struggle with values inside the EU. We have to struggle uh, with values inside NATO. And of course, one could question whether any cooperation which is done for strategic reasons with certain states in the world can be justified by our adherence to values. I leave it at that when it comes to values. I want to speak about strategic interest, strategic restraint, Sergei is right, we had the first crisis in 1998, but we were able to find a compromise to overcome that crisis, and I just alluded to this compromise of 1999. We could balance 
yeah. our mutual strategic interests <coughs> by basically three, uh, by three instruments. One is arms control, where we kept restraint visibly and verifiable. One is the cooperation on security issues, be it in the OSCE, but also in the NATO Russia uh, Council. And of course, one was the adaptation of the um, CFE treaty. And finally, it is the European Security Charter where we agreed, and that's interesting, all agreed to create a common area of uh, uh, space of common security without dividing lines. It is a norm in principle which is still valid, but of course we are far away from that, and the question is how do we get there? Ladies and gentlemen, half time. We are at half time during this debate. We kicked it off with initial statements. Now the, the four discussants had an opportunity to respond to one another. The third of the fourth round involves you. Now is your chance to grill and question uh, the discussants uh, here. Uh, we're going to take three, four questions, throw it back to you, because mm -hmm. this is obviously an interactive format. This is your chance to grill and question the participants. We already have uh, three, three uh, remarks. Right there, we start, we start with a gentleman, we start with a gentleman, I'm coming through the rows. I just, I just asked you, because I've already seen four or five hands up, to be very brief, please. Please go ahead, introduce yourself. Thank you. Roman Kowalczuk, uh, Director of Education Center Could you speak for up? Um, Belarusian Civic Society. Uh, I have a question to uh, Mr. Markedonov. Uh, in the last couple of years, can you tell how many times uh, Russian uh, military airplanes uh, fly over um, uh, territorial waters of Baltic states, no Norway, e even e in our region where we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, isn't it uh, disrespect uh, towards uh, 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 NATO countries or a bloc uh, uh, militarily, first of all, and politically? Mm -hmm. And uh, second uh, question goes to uh, Mr. James Scher. Uh, so what should be a response uh, of the West and uh, NATO uh, to that, uh, yes, uh, uh, flies over uh, uh, the borders and uh, territorial waters, if there should be any response? Uh, right, I have to cut you off here. I have to cut because we have four or five people, but I think you made your point very clear. Please take notes because I'm going around. I'm not going uh, question by question. The lady up there in the back, I'm not forgetting you. The lady in the back uh, had her hand up first. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Monika Michalishin, Ambassador of Poland. I only just showed uh, comment to the, our uh, Questions, Estonian. Please. Yeah, yeah. To the, our Estonian guests, Poland never occupied Estonia. The last uh, uh, master of the Livonian order asked Polish king to help no man omen against the threats from even the, the terrible. So please uh, take it into just like, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. We go here. We have two, three questions here in the front row. Please come up the gentleman here and then I'm moving the mic uh, over there. I'm not forgetting you. Please let's speed it up. This is a fast-paced process. Go ahead. I'm Vladimir Popkov. I'm coming from Hamburg, Germany. Uh, millions of Russian-speaking people live uh, on the territory of NATO countries. Uh, nowadays, we are uh, visiting a formation of cyberspace in the main world languages, uh, where the difference, the borders, the borders between the different space uh, pass not through the borders of the states. Uh, but through the languages. In Germany, uh, they are clearly different. Uh, the Russian-speaking cyberspace uh, for the same people, citizens and taxpayers of NATO countries, uh, not the same as uh, for uh, German-speaking. Right. And uh, in your opinion, uh, will NATO protect the interest of NATO citizens in the Russian-speaking cyberspace, uh, those in Russian. Thank you. Please, please hand over the microphone, the young gentleman over here. We'll come on this side, Mr. President. Uh, you had your hand up first. Go ahead. Well, Zotles, former president of Latvia, I have two questions to Sergei Makedono. The first one, uh, could you be so kind and write me the top five priority uh, Russian interests? And the second point is, do you have from Russian side 
some positive plan for getting out of the situation we do have right now. Right, thank you so much. Please pass on the mic right back, the two gentlemen, and I think we're wrapping it up then. Go ahead. Thank you, Henning Rieke, German Council on Foreign Relations. Question goes to um, Mr. Markedov and Mr. Scher. Um, how do you respond to the argument that Putin needs the confrontation, the warlike relationship with NATO to bolster his political position inside Russia so that there might be an element of um, a certain interest to have this conflict alive for him to strengthen his, his internal position? And if I have, uh, unless I have overlooked anyone, this yes. is the final, the fi yeah, yeah, yes. I know, I know, right. you have the microphone, I'm just looking in the room not to overlook anyone. This is the final one. Yes, thanks. Uh, and um, I, I sit because it's, um, otherwise it's very hard to speak uh, in front of a loudspeaker. Uh, NATO Russia Founding Act. It's based on eight principles. Russia has violated at least seven of them, maybe eight of two. Uh, my question is uh, to Mr. Richter. What does Russia has to do finally for Germany to agree to abrogate the act? Gentlemen. You are in the hot seat. I think we've had uh, quite a number of questions here directed towards you. I think, Wolfgang, you wanted a clarification for, for the last question? There you go. Sergey, let's kick it off. Uh, you were addressed a couple of times directly. This is your chance to respond. Okay, a uh, couple of thoughts because a lot of questions. As for top five, maybe I cannot name top five, top three maybe. Uh, the first point, uh, equality in our relations with the uh, dominant superpower United States. What does it mean, equality? Where Russian arguments are seriously taken into the account. If NATO or USA want to do this, Russia want to do that, as a result, third decision should be done. The uh, second point, security along the state borders and relationship with neighbors. It's necessary to understand a couple of very clear things. Okay, I am not a Russian official. I can say Abkhazia is an integral part of Georgia. Okay, in this way we should make the next step and next conclusion. Not all Georgians, not all citizens of Georgia are in favor of NATO. This is why we see collapse or split in opinions for better security options. And we should take into the account those minor options also. Otherwise we should recognize the uh, priority of one ethnicity over other one. As for a uh, uh, positive plan, uh, <laughs> what do you mean positive? Because um, frequently I hear uh, from uh, my uh, colleagues uh, from the West uh, accusations that Russia uh, cannot uh, offer any positive agenda. Excuse me, money transfers from Russia to Tajikistan compose a very solid percent of GDP. The same is in Georgia right now. Till nowadays, Georgia is the first country for money transfers. Russian tourism in Georgia uh, provided a lot of uh, labors, a lot of jobs, and so on. Azerbaijan and uh, some, other, some other situations. And Russia is attractive till nowadays for uh, people from uh, former USSR Republic. It's necessary also to take into the account. As for mm. Russian communities abroad and uh, uh, Western, uh, Western countries, Baltic countries, first conclusion, very important. Uh, it's impossible to portray Russian community like well-organized group. It's not army, it's not central committee of Communist Party, by the way. It's not verticalized structure. Even in Latvia, we see people who stayed here from the Soviet time or old believers. Two Russian communities, by the way, very different, with different level of knowledge of Latvian language, integration, and so on and so on. In other countries, the situation is not the same, but similar. This is why uh, stop uh, using these factor instrumentally, because it worsened uh, and worsened uh, relationship between Russia and other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, as for uh, military incidents between Russia and NATO, my uh, chief and good uh, colleague Andrei Sushansov described the situation like new normality. Maybe it's not quite normal, but it's new normality. Normality demonstrating new confrontation. And in the case of Baltics, by the way, we see also positive experience how to prevent incidents. And nowadays, in the context of Black Sea area, we discuss the uh, positive, positive experience, new normal experience of the uh, Baltic countries. Uh, yes, we live in this normality, but we should uh, maybe uh, step together each other. But in this way, we should listen to argumentation. 
And uh, one more point about strategic culture. I agree with uh, James and Willier on uh, the uh, different approach to strategic culture and uh, Russian uh, concern about borders. But I ask usually my students about the date of uh, German Nazis entering Minsk, 27th of June. Don't forget that uh, this war started along the line of Stalin, not Molotov. When Germans, German Nazis, of course, would uh, enter Minsk and start in, uh, started bombing Moscow. Third, second day, and so on. Mm -hmm. Nothing personal. It's strategy, porous borders, no natural uh, barriers between uh, Russia and other countries, and necessity to uh, right. be secure. Of course, right. even without context of Hitler, we remember uh, uh, experience of Cardon Sanitaire. And NATO enlargement was perceived in similar way, not the same, but similar, like Cardon Sanitaire knew. So many questions were directed to we, towards you personally, so thank you for, for taking the time to, to feel those questions and answer them uh, and, and, and not shy away from, from uh, answering those questions. Uh, James, a couple of questions were coming your way as well. Yes. Uh, first on the overflights. There are two purposes for those overflights, let's understand. The first is military. It's, um, it's uh, uh, what Russians call Razvietka Boyam. It is undertaking the reconnaissance to, to assess an adversary, potential adversary's capabilities. This was the norm in the Cold War, and because we now have a relationship that Russians call Pratyvavorstva, antagonism, it's becoming normal now. But the second purpose is intimidation. And the answer to intimidation anywhere, at any time, is don't be intimidated. Now, the real practical challenge, what we really need, and I thank very much the Russian military for drawing our attention to it, is uh, that we need a major investment, which is institutional as well as financial, in air and missile defense uh, in the entire NATO uh, area. Uh, second question to me, uh, which general point, um, very interesting point which can lead in many directions about the role of language and language transcending borders and information speech. Let us not forget, please, that one reason Russia immediately got into a tupik, a dead end in Ukraine, and the Novorossiya project fell apart, is that the Russians assume there that language denotes your political loyalty. The mm -hmm. Ukrainian state in the 1990s, I spent a lot of time with these people, these were largely Russian-speaking people from Eastern Ukraine. Um, so let's not typecast and stereotype this, uh, simplify this question. It's not just Russians who do this. I know Estonians and Latvians who do it. We don't need it. Um, third, uh, th third point. Yes, thank you for mentioning because it's a fundamental point. The, the domestic equation and its relevance to Putin's foreign policy, is it there? Yes but it does not explain everything. It mm -hmm. doesn't explain most things. Today, I think Sergei would agree, uh, there is a majority, not a huge majority, of Russians who are very worried about a renewal of military conflict. They don't want to see the Ukrainian situation escalate. Does that mean Russian policy over Ukraine and other matters is softening? No, not one iota. Thank you so much, James. Equally straightforward uh, in his answer, just like Sergei, very much appreciate it. That's how we... Can I just underscore, Russia, like any other country, perhaps more than most countries, has geopolitical interests and understands them as geopolitical interests, and you can't explain them away by saying that this is simply, uh, this is simply a way to manage a succession problem inside the country. Point has been made. Villiers. Thanks. Vilya, now we uh, get your take uh, on some of the audience reactions. You have the floor. <clears throat> yes, I didn't get any questions, but uh, as the overflights concern me a bit, I maybe, uh, maybe just uh, touch that, that issue. Uh, it's also related to uh, something what we want to present as we are the victims. And, and uh, this uh, is the broader Baltic uh, image that uh, we are the victims of Russian imperialism and uh, we have no money to deal with that, not even a single uh, air defense system. And uh, as it was said, may maybe they even collecting data. First, uh, I think they don't need any rec reconnaissance there because they have the knowledge quite well about that, what we don't have, as we don't have almost anything. So there is nothing to collect once you don't have. 
second is, <laughs> as it was said, if you want to convince them, then put something there, lock on them, and they might understand. As simple as that. If you don't protect yourself, whom do you want to protect? And the third point is it has also been related to the transponders issue that the Russian planes are dangerous to the civilian planes. Uh, so you think uh, the Russian planes are invisible or what? They are not invisible. We see them, but our military is not sharing the data with civilian uh, controllers. So basically, missing link between military radars and civilian radars are, is the one which causes the problem, but we blame Russians. You truly believe that we don't see the Russian airplanes in our airspace? We don't see them. So Sven confirms that it's, uh, the data goes, so we don't have a problem with transponders. Why are we then stressing it too often? So this is just an example of that, that how Baltic has put it themselves. And that yeah. We want to be important, right. but we want to be important as right. victims. We even are ready to spend, I think, 6% from GDP to be even more victims. But my concern is that bigger you make yourself as a prize, more interesting you will be for Russia. For example, if you say that uh, occupying Tallinn will mean the end of NATO, then, it, then that is what you get. Because that is something what Vladimir Vladimirovich can really do <coughs> if there is a price sufficient peak. Thank you, thank you Viljar. Three out of four, almost done with round uh, three, but of course, Wolfgang, you are now going to conclude the third round involving answering and reacting to what the audience has been saying. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, I continue with the overflight since, since we are just there, and I remind you, that in the OSCE, a uh, structured dialogue takes place and it goes through all the grievances we have between uh, NATO and Russia. Uh, interesting enough, it is done in the OSCE, not in the NATO-Russia Council. You see, I'm not amused about that. Uh, the line between show of force and deterrence and intimidation is very thin. And it is rather a question of perception of the mutual, of the other side. Um, Reconnaissance is clear, we talked about it, but when it comes to this question of incidents, the air became rather thin in the OSCE, in the OSCE dialogue, since states were um, requested to re, um, submit some reports about airspace violations, and the answer was quite thin. And then it became clear that one should distinguish between the international air and sea space, which is the high seas and the airspace on top, which sometimes is covered by nationally decided air defense identification zones so that one can rec recognize early enough that there are uh, other military aircraft flying and, and maybe give a signal that they should not come too close, or the so-called flight information regions, which is a quite civilian uh, ECAO type of guiding civilian aircraft. Of course, their overlap in high seas had nothing to do with uh, national waters or uh, the exclusive economic zones, which are sometimes also put in the picture. Everybody has the right to fly through this kind of international airspace. This is not a violation. The violation only concerns the 12 sea mile zone, which is a national territory. And one should distinguish it and not ex exaggerate the issue. It's, it's difficult enough. So on, I'm not sure whether I understood your question on the cyberspace, which is probably the space of opinions that are exchanged or fake news in, in the national, whatever that is, uh, in the debate. I think a, a democracy and a vibrant society like ours should be resilient enough to, to, to cope with different opinions. And not every opinion we might like that are, you know, um, uh, that are uh, proposed in the be it in the cyber or in the media or mm -hmm. somewhere, that is the essence of democracy and of uh, the freedom of speech to have a clear uh, controversy on that. If it comes to real fake news or to defamation, that is something different. That's a question mm -hmm. then for the lawyers. But I don't think that NATO has any role to play in the protection mm -hmm. of the public opinions and the discussions right. in the, in, in the uh, member states. Uh, my last point is, it was your question, what should Russia do to revitalize the NATO-Russia founding act? No, uh, Russia has attacked Georgia, attacked Ukraine, 
understand. I, <clears throat> I don't speak for the government, that is clear, but I have opinions and I have uh, uh, thought about some proposals I wanted to make in this last round, but I can yes. at least uh, say the following. Uh, of course, we have to go back, all sides, in particular Russia in this case, to the rules-based international order. The principles have to be held up and there should not be any compromise. The question is how to get there. So there might be minor steps because we cannot um, expect that we change the world tomorrow overnight. So, but minor steps are possible. Also, when I speak to Russian colleagues, uh, of course, first thing is when we don't have dialogue, we will not find out what my, minor steps are. So I'm not so, I was not so amused that the NATO Russia Council uh, does only take place occasionally on the political uh, ambassadorial level but that we for a long time did not have any military dialogue right. because we have to speak about details. Uh, you need military experts. Right. For example, on incident prevention. We need to on, speed it up, just quickly. Okay, there's a lot of, uh, maybe I, I refer then to my last uh, uh, round. There's a lot what we can do, and Russia in particular, uh, when it comes to the Ukraine conflict, I think the Normandy format should be very active now to get at least the Minsk agreement working so that we can bring the military clashes that right. still uh, occur there to a halt. Right. That doesn't solve all the political problems, but it would be a major step right. forward. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, uh, we have another panel, the final panel actually waiting for us on transatlantic discussions. Very much looking forward to that one, the icing on the cake, if you will, at this year's Riga Security Forum. But before we do, we had three out of four rounds. Now comes the final one. And in this one, I will be very stringent uh, as far as time is concerned. For that, I will ask you to go up again uh, to the podium because we had a Slido poll in the beginning. The result was quite clear. 80, 90 percent in the audience believe that Russia is very much to be blamed. Sergey, this is your final chance to persuade the audience <laughs> to vote otherwise because we are going to conduct this poll in just a moment for the second and final time. The floor is yours. Three minutes, your last pitches. Three minutes to push to 99. Yes? Three minutes to, to, to win over the audience. Go right ahead. Good okay. luck. Thank you so much again. Uh, first point, this discussion was very useful. It clearly showed that real communication with quarrels, arguments is possible. And not only here in this audience. Let's see on Moldova. Did values become an uh, obstacle to uh, withdraw Mr. Plakhatnyuk between the EU, uh, US and Russia? No problem. The same is with Minko SE group. This is why it's possible, not only in theory, but in order to uh, do it, it's necessary to prevent, uh, to, to, prevent to overcome some uh, stereotype approach like no business as usual. Okay. Please be creative. Propose new kind of business. I hear uh, from uh, my Western experts and politicians every uh, time one idea. No conflicts could be resolved with Moscow. Great. I agree with it. But in this way, please take into the account Russian motivations and interests. Not so. Uh, it's Russian. This is why no discussion. It's Putin's and so on and so on. Please. Russia is an actor. Russia is a player in the European security arena because 80% of our population concentrates in the European part. If we consider, according to European values, human factor is the most important, please take it into account. 80% of our population in Europe and Russia will play in Europe as an actor. And uh, last not least, brief clarification about Russian attacks on Georgia. Guys, uh, this story didn't start at 2008. Ethnopolitical conflicts went back to the early uh, 90s. 4% of Abkhaz were killed in the fighting of 1992-1993. It was a very complicated problem. It's not just accident whim of Mr. Putin or Mr. Medvedev to attack Georgia. Don't oversimplify the agenda. Russia has its legitimate interest and they should be taken into account seriously mm -hmm. in order to overcome crises like Ukrainian or Georgia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sergei, for making that one final pitch uh, to sway over the audience after all the arguments were exchanged. James, your final three minutes. International politics is not a morality play. We do not have to be perfect people uh, in order to 
defend our own interests and in order to believe that countries have a right uh, to, be, uh, to be defended. We do not have to be without our own internal differences um, and conflicts uh, to be able to say uh, we are a community of traditions and values and norms um, as much as a community uh, of power. Uh, Russia has a right to its own interests. We have a right to our own interests. Mm -hmm. The fundamental issue at stake here is that um, it, in, in, particularly in Europe, Russia has, Russia is now and in the past largely has defined its own security at the expense of the security of neighbors and other people. That is the fundamental issue. When Russia's military was collapsing in the 1990s, I was one of those who said, in agreement with Russian defense establishment, uh, this is dangerous, Russia needs an army. I fully agree with Sergei that in parts of the former Soviet Union, it was the withdrawal of Soviet and Russian power that was, that was creating a perceived security problem um, more than anything else. Where that's true, that is true. But where it's not true, the rights of states have to be, um, have to be respected. Right. Final minute. What, final point. What happens inside Russia is Russia's business. What happens between Russia and its allies is their business, not our business. But what happens in Ukraine and what happens between Ukraine and its partners is not Russia's business. And that's a distinction we need to maintain. Thank you. Thank you, James. Very strong last uh, pitch there from James. Uh, two out of four we heard. Villiard, you're up next. Uh, your final remarks, your final opportunity to win over the audience. Actually, I would like to continue from uh, where James stopped in that sense that uh, there is a Western belief that uh, you can change people more civilized or societies more civilized and as we are uh, the most civilized part of the world, so we have a moral right on that. We have the right to decide that rabbit is more moral than wolf because rabbit eats grass and wolf eats meat. And if Mr. Putin is considered as a wolf, then it means that we have a right to change him. And uh, if somebody said that uh, Mr. Putin will be a vegetarian and finally is not, then there is a legal problem and, and uh, there is some kind of justification. My point is that we have had experience not with only Mr. Putin, we have had experience with Russia for more than 1,000 years. It's a very comprehensive and very nicely written down. So we had the Yaroslav the Wise. I don't know, was he occupying Tartu or was he invited by the city council of Tartu in that time, 1,000 years ago, as later the Polish uh, who left the flag to Tartu. Uh, but there has been 1,000 years of experience. We have seen things repeating, like with Georgia, like with Ukraine. The justifications have always been the same. It was now or never moment. We are surrounded. They are ganging against us. They are not respecting our borders or our culture. So it is possible to rationally approach Russia. But what do we do instead of that? We talk about something what we call deterrence, what even does not translate into Russian language. You can go to the city boys and small kids who speak Russian and ask what does deterrence mean in Russian. Nobody knows. It has no meaning, but we all believe that the Russians understand it. That there is in Russian military a Polkovnik understanding what does deterrence mean and how to be deterred, and not to be sent to Siberia if he's deterred. Right. Final we, minute. Yes, we have a dead end uh, concept. And instead of that, in this complex situation, I think West needs to ask first, are we listened? Are we understood? Are they responding? And I think this is where we should start, instead of being very simple, what we usually are in the Baltic, telling that as long as the Americans are with us, everything is okay, uh, that will uh, make everything go well against Russia. Uh, so I hope uh, 
this is a start of uh, knowing each other better yeah. and then getting some uh, sophisticated and intellectual yeah. results. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're moving towards the end of this session, but this may be the start of something entirely uh, different. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Wolfgang, last but certainly not thank least, you. lovely to hear from you, your final pitches. You, you and James started off with a very nice cushion, but uh, le let's see, you, you have three minutes to thank see how the vote goes. Thank you, Ali. Uh, so um, let me start off when it comes to the question, how can we get out of the situation we are in? And let me start off with some assumptions. First, while NATO is concerned about the sub-regional force balance here in the region, and its northeastern periphery, Russia is concerned about the global strategic balance. To Moscow, the Ukraine conflict is part of the global peace, uh, a global uh, power competition. So there are some imbalance in perceptions which we have to overcome by dialogue. It is not in the interest, second, of either side to escalate the situation deliberately and risk uh, a war between Russia and NATO that could and would not be limited to the Baltic subregion. But unintended incident can't be, incidents can't be excluded. Third, the deep political rift between Russia and the West will not be overcome easily and probably will stay with us for some time to come. And fourth, we could, however, look at the lessons learned in the past. The Cold War has not been overcome only by deterrence, but by a double-track approach that was agreed as early as 1968 uh, and that offered an open dialogue and strategic restraint enshrined in mechanisms of cooperation, confidence, security building measures, and concrete arms control measures. Against this background, I would now propose the following modest but hopefully uh, uh, important measures to de-escalate. First, strengthen incident prevention measures. Second, agree on mutual restraint measures when it comes to large-scale and surprise exercises and increase transparency. To that end, a stability arrangement uh, for the wider Baltic region, don't speak about Baltic states, but wider Baltic region to include parts of the Western Russian Western military districts should be envisaged. Concrete proposals are on the table. Right. Third, political and also military dialogue should be intensified to achieve these goals to work toward escalatory measures, de-escalatory measures. Sorry. It should include discussion of military doctrines and also of ambiguous signals when it comes to the nuclear weapons. Uh, the need, and this is forced, to avoid a new race for stationing of land-based INF and um, there's um, a need to make parallel or better common declarations to that extent. In this context, we should strive uh, for an extension of new start by five years, which is possible, and use the time for negotiations. Right. Final minutes. As a follow-up agreement with a wider scope, which could also account for the INF, the gap which we are missing now. Um, the Normandy format needs to be revitalized, I uh, refer to that already, and work actively towards full implementation of the Minsk Agreement. And finally, I would uh, think that Russia should, as a further de-escalatory measures, give clear signals to its neighboring countries and assurances that it would not intervene to protect countrymen abroad. And I would add since we have to speak in diplomacy about reciprocity, NATO could also propose to make a similar statement and saying we don't intervene in internal uh, affairs of Russia. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. Yes, please, uh, go right ahead. Uh, and <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks, Wolfgang. At the end, uh, try and even solutions out of this dilemma uh, that we've been having. I think I speak for all when I say this has been a very dynamic, very lively discussion and it has shown that even though the situation of course is tense and the relationship is strained, that a civil debate, a civil discourse is possible. Uh, Sergei Wolfgang, James Villia, and I think for that we owe these four gentlemen a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been wonderful. Now. Ladies and gentlemen, we voted in the beginning of this session. Uh, I think we had about 80, 90 percent of people holding NATO, holding Russia responsible primarily. Let, let's see if any votes were swayed, any votes were changed uh, throughout uh, the process. Uh,
The poll is ongoing. Uh, Sergey and Villar, if I'm not mistaken, this is, uh, you, you seem to have uh, changed a mind or two here. We still only have 31 person, people in the room uh, voting. We're still waiting for a couple of minutes. But regardless of the outcome, I think uh, all sides, all sides were very blunt, were very honest, very straightforward in their responses, very much appreciated. Sometimes these formats suffer from beating around the bushes. Certainly no bushes were beaten around here, ladies and gentlemen. So if I'm looking at the poll, both to Sergei uh, and to Vilya, certainly put up a very courageous fight. Um, and it seems to me that one or the other votes has, might have shifted. But of course, primarily, uh, the predominant majority of the fact, actually, we're now for the first time in the 70s as far as primary uh, responsibility is concerned. But of course, primarily responsible for the current complicated relationship between NATO and Russia. As Wolfgang has said, it's not all black and white, of course, but this is Slido, and we have to keep it to a uh, simplistic uh, question format. So we got it. For that, once again, my big thanks for a, for a great debate. Certainly, this is a topic that will be with us for a very long time to come. Thank you so much. This is your applause. Thank you, gentlemen.